and Nicola Blount of the Black Women's Health Imperative, and I'm excited to welcome you back to Black and Well TV. A few years ago, with support from Gilead Sciences, BWHI launched on our own terms, a coalition of black, national black women's organizations and experts that combines data-informed approaches, evidence-based practices, and cross-sector collaborations to strengthen community assets, deliver innovative solutions, and make lasting impact on the health and wellness of black, cis, and transgender women. The global, this global pandemic has exposed the health disparities that have made everyday black women particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. Vulnerabilities that those of us impacted by HIV are already too familiar with. Today's discussion will focus on the experiences black, of black women living through this pandemic, how we can find strength and build community in our continued work to end the HIV epidemic and to understand the underlying causes so that we can target our programs, our policy, and our messaging much more effectively. Our guests today bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise. So let's just get right to it. Our first guest is Vanita Ray. Vanita is the Deputy Director of the Positive Women's Network USA, a national membership organization for women living with HIV. Vanita has served as a public policy manager where she monitored HIV-related policy for federally qualified health centers in Houston, Texas. And she's managed an advocacy and leadership training program for people living with HIV. She's deeply committed to ending HIV criminalization, ensuring the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV in all decisions that impact the HIV community and achieving racial justice in the domestic HIV response. Vanita was diagnosed with HIV in 2003. Hey, Vanita, how are you doing? Hey, Linda, I'm doing well. Good, yeah, good. How are you? I'm, you know, doing okay, doing okay. I always want to ask how people are, are doing and how they're feeling. Yeah, thank you. So um, talk to us a little bit about the Positive Women's Network um, and, you know, it's COVID-19 and Policing Community Res Resource Hub and a little bit about how, how you're using this tool to empower women and others to, to help keep our community safe. Sure, first of all, thank you for really having me and giving me a chance to talk about this. But the Positive Women's Network is an organization started by women living with HIV, diverse group of women. And we are here and we're going on, I think 12 years next month, to develop leadership for women living with HIV and increasing their capacity to be involved at all levels of decision making, also to impact policy decisions and mm. get folks engaged in policy decisions that impact us at the federal and at the local level. And so we've been pushing an agenda that enables women living with HIV everywhere to live free, vibrant, you know, lives, even with HIV. So all in everything that encompass, which is intersexual in nature, that looks at immigration, it looks at policing, it looks at economic justice, reproductive justice, so all of those aspects and, and how do we build power, political power and for our base. And most recently we've been involved in electoral organizing. How do we influence policy at the ballot box as well? Mm -hmm. And so the COVID, and so one of the things we do on our website, is, you know, is we have a lot of tools and resources for folks to, not only do we do a lot of training to engage people to, and teaching skills, but we also mm -hmm. include a lot of resources for advocacy. And the COVID-19 and policing uh, community resource hub was started by our fabulous policy department, uh, Brianna Diaz and Kelly Flannery, I have to give them props, but they, they partnered with a lot of social justice organizations to bring this tool and resource to the community. And it was to, to help folks stay safe, to mobilize folks, 
instead of cops, stops, and tickets, cuffs, and sales. So mm. it's a twofold thing. So it, it allows people to go on this website at the Community Resource Hub and you can look at your jurisdiction and see what laws or orders are in place around the pan COVID pandemic so that you can be aware of what's going on in your community. And then secondly, it also, and I think this is really important, it's an enforcement tracker. You can go in and look and see what kind of policing that has occurred and potentially mm. look up policing in, in um, your area and see what kind of policing has occurred. So this enables people to maybe mobilize if they want to lift up some of this that's been going on. Because we know that Black folks have been ticketed at higher rates and things mm -hmm. like that. But, but but on that enforcement tracker, it always also has a, a reportable database so that if incidents are going on in your community, you can input those in there so that they're added to the database that allows others to see what's going on. Uh, okay. So, it, so not only does it give you information and resources to know what's happening, but it's also given us a chance to collect data and build resources that folks can use. Is this in, in I guess, is it in every state or what states? Well, we is have... That in? You know, well, the hub is a national, so you can go okay. in there and search. And I see one of our folks put in the chat box the uh, link to it, but you can go in there and search for your jurisdiction, your state, and find what's going on in terms of pandemic and laws and orders, and then report uh, enforcement. And the enforcement is built around things that have been in the media or self reports. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a grassroots collection of information, and folks can put in new information so we can build the database. Got it. So as you as you think about the the federal COVID nineteen um, response and relief, particularly around HIV, what else would you like to see? What could be done to to better address the needs of Black women impacted by HIV? I, that's probably a really big question. It is, <laughs> but but I do have to, so to me though, Black women as a whole, you know, we represent sixty percent of the HIV epidemic, so we're disproportionate impact. So we're already dealing with one epidemic, and now we've got a pandemic that don't, not only is impacting us but our communities, and you know. Um, I would say that the same things that we needed before this pandemic are just exacerbated now. I mean, the systems and, and support wasn't the greatest for black women. I mean, we don't get talked about a lot. And I, you know, and, and, and the rates of the epidemic other than kind of shaming and blaming language versus, you know, our society as a whole has never given black women the same kind of um, uh, protection it deems for white women in terms of providing us the support and, and, and services needed for black women. So black women live at this intersection of race and gender. So all of those racial implications that come with that, and then the gender-based violence, gender inequality and in, in pay. So we need the same kinds of things we needed before was access to culturally appropriate health care. We need uh, economic justice and stability for our communities, a living wage, uh, housing, you know, the same sexual health and reproductive services that we needed to be able to, to really stay on top of our health um, for in terms of HIV. And let me just say this, HIV disproportionately affects Black women, not because of who and what, how much sex we're having. There are structural and root cause issues that are related to the epidemic and root cause issues around poverty, racism, transphobia, all other kinds of issues that are that are real structural in nature. And we tend to focus on the topical kind of surface issues, which we need that stuff addressed. But how about paying us a living wage? How about closing the gender gap? How about giving us reproductive justice and in, in terms of health care? Uh, uh, how about now under the pandemic, we're having to school homeschool our kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we may be the only wage earner in the house. And I don't mean to feel any stereotypes. We're not always, but we're also dealing with the impact of increased policing of our communities. I mean, we are the caretakers for our communities and our families. And we know as black women get better, everyone gets better, right? And right. So the same, you know, mental health trauma, you know, those same kind of services that we needed before are just exacerbated mm -hmm. around the pandemic and the increased economic issues, the, the elevation of the health disparity issues that have been raised around here. And I, I deal a lot with, and those issues have been there for the longest and they, they really are rooted in uh, ineffective healthcare delivery systems in most of our communities. I live in the South. And so in the South is even exacerbated more with our rural communities and our lack of real effective leadership.
So, yeah, and the medical model um, uh, wants to make it our fault. I mean, right. it's, you know, it's always, well, if they wouldn't only do whatever, then they wouldn't have that. But to your point, there are real structural barriers, policy barriers, um, Absolutely. access barriers. Yeah. So given all that and given the stress of COVID-19, I mean, we're all feeling it in, in one way or another, you know, how are you able to stay motivated in the work but also, you know, keep the women you serve motivated because this could be really overwhelming. Yeah, that's that's a really good question because it has been, you know, the work wasn't easy before COVID, you know, having to work in, in, a, in, in a structure that folks don't pay enough attention to what's going on and in the black community in the South. Now it's just, I, I've gotten angry. So part of, you know, is motivated that way, but, but also, um, I feed off the the uh, work and the the motivation and the desire and compassion of other women living with HIV around the country who want to be engaged, who need this the, these kind of services. This is just up my commitment to the work mm -hmm. and and seeing the brilliance of women around the country living with HIV who are still showing up virtually, who are still trying to register voters, who are still doing the work. I'm here to create leaders. And so, you know, who's in office, a pandemic can't change that because we've got work to do. When we look at the level of racial, uh, anti-Black racial violence that's going on, you know, that's impacting a mother somewhere, right? Yeah. So I am continually motivated by not only the HIV community and the women that I serve who are who are serving me as well, but I've also had to find other ways to find support by online virtual support groups, healing circles, uh -huh. We're doing a lot of healing justice work because we know folks need it. And so it has not been easy, but um, I want to inspire others to make a difference as well. So sometimes you don't see me when my head may need to be bowed for a moment because I got to go <laughs> replenish, but I yeah. have come back and keep doing this because the, the need just got greater. It didn't get less. And I'm that's, not. That's it. true. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and hang in there. Um, you know, take, take time for yourself. You know, we believe in self care, but, yes. but please keep doing the work. I, so I, I want you to just stand by. I'm going to bring in Leisha McKinley Beach um, to have a conversation, but we're going to bring you back, Benita. Um, and while we're waiting for Leisha to come up, I just want to, um, I forgot to mention, remind you all that if you've got questions, there's a chat box, please use it. We'll get to as many questions um, as we can. And while we're waiting on Leisha to come up, let me just give her her, her brief bio because she is really phenomenal. Um, Leisha serves as an HIV prevention consultant with um, several health departments and organizations across the country. And in this role, she provides capacity building assistance and training at for health departments, federally qualified health centers, prep training for providers serving black populations, and strategy facilitation for local health planning coalitions. She's also launched several projects, um, one, of it, one of which is Thought for the Day. It's a podcast that provides inspirational messages, um, which launches the, the end of June. And another is Ending HIV for Humanity Everywhere. You can find out more about um, these podcasts uh, at her site, Leisha.org. Um, Leisha is a graduate of the University of West Florida and the University of Florida. And in her bio, there was this little thing at the, at the bottom. And, and because they're not in the Big Ten, I can say this, she has go Gators, but really I mean go blue. But let's bring Leisha on and, and talk to her about the, the work she's doing and uh, in this time of, of COVID-19. And again, while we're waiting for, for her to come on, um, I just want to remind you, there's a number of questions. We are going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, and those that we can't answer during this webcast, we'll answer after the fact and we'll get them up on our, on our website. So, well, we're, we're waiting for Leisha. Maybe she's having some trouble connecting. And while we're waiting, I just sort of want to reinforce um, something Benita said. And she talked about Black women being 13% of the female population and 
4% of all or 60% of all new HIV infections. And it is not because of, uh, of personal behavior. It's because of the circumstances um, that we exist in. You know, these barriers to good jobs, living wage jobs, access to health care, prevention, um, child care. These are all the structural barriers that keep women from making the kinds of choices that they need to make and want to make to be as healthy as possible. Hey, Alicia, how are you? Hi, Linda. Just having some technical difficulty, <laughs> but that's all right. I'm glad to be here. Well, good. We're happy to have you here. So so how are you feeling in, in, in the midst of, of all of this? You know, Linda, I was on a call earlier today uh, with some young Black leaders and HIV, and I said, you know, I, I try to be the voice of uh, reason. I try to live by, um, you know, the principles that uh, nonviolence is the answer. Um, but there are moments that, you know, you just get hit below the belt and it makes you question that. And so I'm not ashamed to say that's that's the space that I'm, that I'm in today. You know? Okay, I understand. There's a lot going on and we're, we're really constantly bombarded yes. um, with stuff. That's a technical term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so as you kind of think about your work and you're talking to health department leaders and folks working to deliver health care to, to women across the country, what does the continuum of care look like for black women living with HIV to sort of in general, but now, I mean, how has COVID-19 changed what that continuum of care, um, how that expresses for them? You know, Linda, um, uh, Vanita, she could have had my five minutes of fame because she was on a roll really describing and framing some of the challenges with Black women living with HIV. You know, that beyond just the, the gender, um, you know, many, many women still face racism. Um, you know, many women, I say that with health departments, and this is not for all health departments, but there are quite a few across the country, particularly in the South, that they treat women, Black women, is, is, is how... Um, Ryan White was attended. It's the payer of last resort, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I have to receive my care there, then for most instances, that the health department is my last resort. I know that. I feel that. But when I walk through the door, you don't have to treat me that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you couple that with living with HIV, the stigma that comes with it, even for the people that you are serving, oftentimes are stigmatizing you. Uh, using language that's, you know, not sensitive uh, to, to what Black women who are living with HIV are going through. And if that wasn't enough, now I have yet another um, health issue that I'm coupling with that. And some of just the blatant lack of cultural sensitivity has been present. You know, I, I had, uh, this was very personal this week when I had a family member of mine who said, I did what you told me to do, right? Mm -hmm. They had been exposed to someone um, who tested positive for COVID-19. Um, this person has comorbidities. They went to the health department as directed, and the health department said they didn't meet the criteria to be tested. So can you imagine how I felt as the public health professional thing? I'm doing my job helping mm -hmm. to get you to where the services are, and you get there, and you are denied Right. What you are entitled to. Right. Um, and so when you think about layer after layer after layer of red tape and injustice and demeaning language and oftentimes subpar service, you know, it is enough to get us in a space that we feel less than and not worthy of. 
Yeah. And we're, we're made to feel as though something's wrong. And now, I mean, it seems like so long ago, February, the, the, the message was, well, COVID-19 is not really affecting black people. Mm -hmm. And now the message is, oh, that's who's being affected. Mm -hmm. So women, I would think, run the risk of being looked at with suspicion, even as they're walking in to seek care. Linda, when I first saw the February headline, it took me back. You know, this this week you you told the world just about how old I am and how long I've been doing this work. Um, but when I saw the February headline, and 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 it read, you know, like our first five COVID nineteen cases, and hearing health officials saying that you know, this is probably not going to affect the community in a great way. It took me back almost 30, you know, years ago, uh, longer than that, quite actually, to that 1981 MMWR mm -hmm. that said there was this mysterious, you know, uh, pneumonia that they found among five gay white men. And what happened? Our community let our guard down. Finally, something that doesn't affect us. Yeah. Right? And so now here we are almost 40 years later, still raising awareness about HIV. Vanita just told you, 60% uh, of the female cases, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we own them as Black women. That's nothing for us to be proud about. And then you, you think about all of the challenges that we have had, not external, but within the HIV workforce, right. to have black women be acknowledged, to have black women to be served like everyone else, you know, and, and not just the, the major barriers from uh, uh, women living with HIV, but also for women who are fighting to prevent HIV. You know, we, we've seen the infamous, you know, October 2019 decision for mm -hmm. Scovy. Um, you know, we've just had attention uh, put on the HPTN 083 study for, you know, um, uh, gay men and uh, women of trans experience. And then, yes, there's going to be data coming from the 084 study that's with cisgender women. But why is it that we always have to be second? Yeah. Why is it that no one is uplifting and celebrating and prioritizing us? You know, and so yeah. that's why the fight continues. And yeah. that's why that's why when we look at COVID-19, it's no different than the struggle has been with HIV. Yeah, we, we could have seen that coming from a mile away. Yes. And, and some of us did, actually. So I, I've, I've got a question around states reopening. Um, it, depending on what state you're in, I won't name one in particular, but some really never closed. Um, but you know, now we're, we're reopening. So this has implications for HIV testing. Next month, there's nat National HIV Testing Day. So as you're talking to organizations, um, what is it that they're planning to do? Testing requires in-person contact. So what does reopening look like for the work? And are you concerned that we're actually going to have a fall off in HIV testing? Um, Linda, I mean, you're posing some very great questions and there are some challenges. So let's just be clear. You know, that I agree with you that there are some states um, that, that hadn't closed, that there were some states um, that they, um, they showed us how much they cared about us by opening nail salons and beauty shops and barber mm -hmm. shops and bowling alleys, you know, and, and you can figure out what state I'm talking about, the one I'm sitting in right now, you know, and so now we're coming up on one of the largest observances uh, in, in our uh, HIV world. What we've done, and I, I've said this uh, before, those over 40 may not get this, but even in our own community, I mean, under 40 may not get this, but even in our own community, we let in our slip show. Right, we have not done a good job. I'm not even gonna say great, but we have not done a good job of truly 
promoting all the options for HIV testing. And one of those options is home testing. And because we don't have this infrastructure in place, if somebody wants to have a, a, a home test, I went out today to CVS, I looked online, one of uh, the, the cheapest tests that I was able to find was $40. Uh. Now, if you are somebody who have lost their job, waiting on unemployment, or my hours have been cut, I'm still working, $40 could mean meals for the rest of the week for my family while I'm still trying to learn my HIV status. Yeah. You know, and so because there hasn't been this infrastructure, and this again speaks to sometimes a lack of sensitivity and understanding about our communities. You know, CDC, I love them. You know, I'm thankful for them and all the content that they have been putting out to help us during this season of COVID-19. They have uh, fact sheets on their website encouraging home testing. But who are you talking to? You right. talking to the people who can't afford the forty dollars to go get the test to learn my status. Right. And it's so, available, but if you can't afford yes, it, it's not accessible. Yes. yes. So again, it mm -hmm. shows clearly that with our health infrastructure overall, we still don't know the communities that we are serving. That's right. You know. So, Leisha, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm going to come back to you because um, I, I want to hear more about that, and I also want to talk about prep. But I want to bring Valerie Rochester on, and then I'm going to to bring you back. Um, because I, I, I think we've got, we've got a lot to talk about here. Um, but let me just introduce Valerie, um, and then we'll get right into the questions. Um, mm -hmm. And Valerie, you know, you're a member of the family. So, <laughs> you never Valerie, leave. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie Rochester, for more than 25 years, has used her expertise as a health and wellness strategist to provide programmatic, administrative, and technical support services in the public health field. In 2017, Valerie became Vice President of Program Strategy at Age United, a leading HIV advocacy, policy, and education organization in Washington, D.C. There she guides the organization's expansive program, capacity building, and grant making portfolios, investing in communities most affected by the domestic HIV epidemic. That includes women. Prior to joining Age United, Valerie headed up all strategy and programs at the Black Women's Health Imperative. Um, in 2002, she was awarded the Congressional Black Caucus Healthcare Hero Award at the annual CBC Health Brain Trust. And I believe Donna Christensen presented that to you. Is that right? Yeah, she did. Yeah. Okay. A woman of great taste. <laughs> so, you know, I want to start, of course, by just asking you, you know, how you're doing. And, uh, you know, today's quite a day, huh? It's been a week, you know. Um, it, it's been one of those types of weeks where, you know, if you had the opportunity to to take a step back and maybe reverse a few things, uh, mm. but and had the ability to do that, you wish you could. Uh, but yeah, it's been uh, an emotional week. Um, it's been something we've been dealing with at the organizational level. It's been something that I think we've all been dealing with it personally. So. Um, it, it's good to make that place and space to be, to talk about it and to check in with each other and to see how one another's doing, but also to make sure that uh, we step away from it for a little bit and and find that time to do some some self love and self care. So yeah, that's what I'm definitely going to do after this. Okay, <laughs> all right. So you you fund work at the community level, right? Um, what have you heard from the field about how organizations have adapted their work um, to continue this fight. Uh, um, and, you know, are you concerned about any of the organizations that you're funding? I'm going to start with the last part of that question. I'm very concerned. Um, we're concerned because one of the things that I think it's important to understand is, you know, we use the term adapt, you know, how organizations are adapting. But to adapt means that you're able to make adjustments and make changes and continue doing the same kind of thing. And 
there are organizations out there that just aren't able to adapt or to pivot and do something different uh, amid all of this because they're they're struggling to survive. They're struggling to keep the doors open. They're struggling to to pay staff that can continue to provide services to the communities that they're intended to serve. And so I think that's one of the things that's most disheartening to hear uh, when we hear from organizations that have to make a choice about whether they're going to provide services or pay salaries for staff, or if they have to close the doors altogether uh, or cut back services, needed services mm -hmm. that aren't available anywhere else. So the clients they serve won't have any place to go. So you know, we're hearing about the adjustments that are needing to be made, uh, whether it's layoffs, whether it's uh, furloughing staff, cutting back hours, making a decision about the kinds of services that they're able to provide, uh, making the hard decision about whether they have PPE that they can provide to staff that work directly with clients. Um, but it, it's it's something that we're continuing to hear about and we're looking at ways that we can provide support through the funding that we currently provide to over 200 and some organizations that are grantees of Age United. We've looked at how we can adjust our funding and our, the grants that we provide so that they can switch from or convert from being program or project specific grants to more general operating so that they can meet those existing needs and not have to worry about, you know, having to close their doors or having to lay off staff. They're able to yeah. use that money as they need. We don't determine how they need to spend it. They determine how they need to spend that money in order to, to survive and to um, continue to do the work during this epidemic. And, and that's what's needed. Uh, um, I remember hearing a long time ago, uh, someone said, people, organizations need, we believe in you money. I mean, you know, yeah. you've got to keep the doors open. There will be life after COVID-19. Yeah. But if your community organizations close, then this epidemic never ends. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, I'm really happy about the work that we're doing with communities because we at Age United have a really strong partnership. And I, I do mean partnership with the organizations that we provide funding support to. And it's an opportunity not only to provide support to organizations that might not ordinarily be able to receive funding, but to also learn from and hear from the needs and the interests and concerns of the communities most affected and shape the funding priorities that we have. And we have a bit of a history as far as responding to epidemics and disasters, basically, uh, with some disaster relief funding that we provided a few years ago. So we were able to look at the lessons learned from that and see how we can bring some of that to bear on the work that's happening now and the things that are happening now in communities. And so we're looking at how we can be even more responsive than we have been. So we've got this immediate crisis now, but as you look out, over the landscape. I mean, we don't know when we'll have a vaccine. It, it yeah. could be years from now. Um, the economic recovery will, will take quite some time, um, obviously, as we know. What are you kind of thinking about at Age United about how best to kind of shore up the structures within communities, um, you know, next year, 2022, um, so that, you know, we can continue talking about ending the epidemic. And obviously, you know, we want to just end it but so many of the issues we're talking about will actually impact our ability to do that. So, right. so what's, what's sort of the, the, I know it's early yet, early yet, but you know, what are you thinking in terms of the long game for AGI? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're looking at things the same way I think a lot of organizations are as far as looking at those structural barriers that both, you know, Vanita talked about and Leisha touched on too. All those things are so much a part of this whole scenario and we need to continue to look at how we're going to address those things. Um, we have to make sure that for black women, especially we continue to look at things like the living wage. Um, you know, I'm a black woman who happens to know that I am very privileged because I have a job that continues to pay me and I can continue to do the work during this time. There aren't all black women that can do that. So making sure that they're, are programs and services and initiatives in place to make sure that black women who have lost their jobs during all of this 
or aren't able to stay at home and take care of their kids uh, during this time since the kids are home from school. Uh, looking at those types of structural issues and determinants of health that have an impact on our ability to take care of our families and to bring home a paycheck and put food on the table and make sure we have medical coverage. So those are the kinds of things that are needed to be considered in addition to the other structural issues that both Vanita and um, Leisha touched on, but also mm -hmm. looking at you know, funding that is going to be made available or continue to be made available through uh, legislative uh, actions that they're looking at as far as relief packages and things like that, making sure that the voices of not only black women, but people living with HIV are at the center of all of this and making sure that we have the data to support, um, mm -hmm. actual data, I should say, to support you know, yeah. what the true impact of COVID-19 is. Uh, because not all data is collected consistently, as we know, by gender, yeah. race, mm -hmm. ethnicity, sexual orientation. None of those things are collected consistently uh, from the state. So we may never truly know what the true impact of COVID-19 is, but we do have to make sure that we try to put those structures in place so that we can at least have an idea of, as we look at this, coming out the other side of this and preparing for the next phase of yeah. this, we have certain things in position, better position to be able to address those. Yeah, we know it's underreported. That we do know. We don't know by how much. Some estimates are 50% of cases, 40% of, of mortality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to bring Vanita back in um, with you and, and kind of and put this question to the two of you. Um, as I'm thinking about as you said, all of the social dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, first we thought we couldn't get COVID-19, black people couldn't get it. Now it's, you know, black people get COVID-19. Um, what is it that you say to black women who are really struggling with this um, and, and who may feel that both they and their voice and the issues of black women are just lost? I mean, we've been struggling for years to try to center black women, you know, do research, get them into trials. Let's you know, let's you know, prioritize their issues. But now some may feel that, that their issues are just lost in, in this COVID-19 um, pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vanita, do you wanna get started? I'm, I'm a little shaken by the question. I know it's appropriate, but it just hit me in the stomach and I, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, you know, Vanita's talked about, you know, wanting to remain positive and inspirational, but we're hearing from women that, yeah. yeah. So for me, you know, my first response is I understand. Mm -hmm. I understand because it, you know, if you look at it all, it doesn't look very promising. There's nobody speaking to our issues at a national level consistently that it does look bleak, it, you know, it, it gets disheartening that every negative outcome is related to black folks and a black woman, you know? And so, you know, what do I say is that we stand on the shoulders of greatness, you know, that we don't have to do it all. We are our system's keeper. And that every lane is equal, you know, that even when you get tired, that, you know, one of the things I've started lately, we have a virtual healing circle online and we, to find ways to support black women in the work or in or just in their daily lives because the work is at home with your kid too if you can't be in the movement spaces that is okay there is a lane and all lanes are equal we need the mothers at home the mothers at pta the mothers at the job and so whether it's in your church you can make a difference whether it's among your friends you can make a difference that we cannot quit you know, I have two grandsons. My daughter posted on Facebook the other day and she said she feels sick in her stomach or out of fear for my grandsons who are 21 and 16. And I understand that. And I felt so helpless because I didn't have an answer for her other than mm -hmm. I must continue. When I get frustrated with this administration and I want to leave the country, I can't leave my people. So I understand find one of us because we will support you through this. We will help you find where you do make the contribution or you continue to make it in your homes and that we stand on the shoulders of greatness that mm -hmm. we don't have to do this alone. And we may not all make it across the finish line, but some before us didn't. And my job is how do, where do I carry it to the next person who can 
who can pick up that bucket and you don't have to do it all either. I know we were thought of as super women, but it is okay to rest that cape. My, my sponsor says there's a rusty cape <laughs> and ask for help. You are not alone. I, you know, one of the things that's caused us to survive is our, our sisterhood. And so yeah. you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was going to say one of the things that I've been really surprised and pleased and so happy about is the number of black women, mainly in this HIV field that we work <laughs> in, yes. that, that just reach out and just check in and say, you know, how you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know what's that's going what on? We do. That's yeah. what we do. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me of you know my days at the Black Women's Health Imperative, uh, <laughs> when you know it was it was really focused on you know self love, self care, and self help, but also making sure that the sister next to you was able to feel and be able to do those same kinds of things. And, you know, we're checking in on each other more. We're making sure that we at least touch base and, and make one another sure that we have that support. And I was reading something today, that, and this is a group of Black women that I don't think we talk about very much among all of the COVID-19 issues, but Black women who are in the healthcare delivery field Mm -hmm. I was reading an article about how they're not feeling supported in their own institutions because not only are they black healthcare providers, but they're having to listen to their coworkers who are non-black healthcare providers, and they're blaming people coming in uh, who are black and brown people talking about them, saying it's their own. So they're not only having to see what the devastation is of folks coming in needing help, but they're also having to defend people in their communities for the things that right. are not their faults. So, you know, when we think about our healthcare workers also, the black women who are the frontline workers, um, you know, giving them that support too, I think is gonna be some, uh, something we need to focus on even more because they're the ones that are in the places that are under-resourced, understaffed and underserved too. Yeah, that, that must be really strange to hear your colleagues complaining right. and then say, well, wait, you know, you're talking about me, right. don't you, you know? Right. Yeah, um, that's so interesting because I hear that even in HIV spaces working professionally and folks talking about them people and every now and then mm -hmm. having to raise my hands, you do know I'm one of them people, so can we watch this? But it, yeah, it, it's really disheartening. Mm -hmm. but, but the inspiration I get from other women, especially women from my community, women living with HIV is astounding. They're just stepping up and even in the midst of all kind of trauma and everything still reaching out. Yeah. So Valerie, you, you, you mentioned this earlier and I wanted to just kind of come back to this for you and, and Benita. Um, you know, you are a woman of privilege. Benita, you're a woman of privilege. You, you are gainfully employed. That's exactly right. But you're out there working with um, having conversations with folks who deliver services to people who are not privileged, who don't enjoy the same privilege as we do. And I include myself, obviously, in, in that group. You know, there's what you all are doing, but what do you want to see the broader HIV community do? Because we're, this is going to be with us for a long time, and we, we just can't afford to lose these women. You know, I think about their emotional wellness. I think, you know, again, about feelings of being lost, but, but you know, I don't want there to be this us versus them within within our own community. Yeah, I, I think there are still a lot of lessons learned though from the early days of the HIV epidemic that we can go back to and learn from because we're seeing the discussion around it, the feeling that, you know, initially black folks weren't affected by HIV, so we thought. And then, you know, then it became COVID-19. And we're seeing the same results from that. So looking at where those public health practices that resulted from HIV and working in the HIV, HIV field and those best practices and lessons learned, taking those and applying them as much as possible to go COVID-19, because it's it's a it's a health condition that feeds on the same social issues, structural barriers and other things that HIV and so many of the preventable health conditions that we have feed on and are the drivers of. So putting those kinds of sensibilities and those strategies in place that address other public health issues, I think is something that's important. And it, it doesn't 
have to be and shouldn't be HIV versus COVID-19 and which do we address? Mm -hmm. It can't be. If we're to survive, it can't be. Because again, the same things that drive it and fuel it are, this, are, are the things that we are all working on. Yeah. Benita, I'm gonna give you the last word on this. No, I, I think Valerie hit it on the head. I think racial injustice is a driver of the epidemic. And now we're seeing that it, it has become a driver of deaths in the pandemic, in the COVID pandemic. So we must address issues around racial justice. It's not just a black issue, it's a human issue. Well, thank you. Um, I, I wish we had more time, um, you know. I wanted. I knew. I knew it was going to go by fast. I, I want to thank Vanita Ray, Deputy Director of Positive Women's Network, Lisa McKinley Beach, um, National HIV/AIDS Consultant, and Valerie Rochester, member of the family and Vice President of, for Program Strategy at AIDS United. Thank you all for your expertise, your wisdom, for your passion, and for not giving up. So on behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative, I want to thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, we have another episode planned for next, next Friday, which begins a month-long series on looking at surviving COVID-19 financially. But before I go, um, we're still at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Perhaps to quote Churchill, we're at the end of the beginning. If we're careful, well, if we care, we can avoid the mistakes of the HIV epidemic that you've heard a little bit about, but I'm afraid we won't learn from history. In 1986, the first HIV criminalization laws were enacted. Some 34 states have HIV specific criminal statutes still in effect. These laws criminalize such actions as non-disclosure, spitting, and refusal to use condoms. They largely ignore the science, for example, saliva doesn't transmit the virus. And they don't take into consideration viral suppression, antiretroviral treatment, and pre-exposure pre prophylaxis. Even states without HIV-specific statutes have prosecuted people living with HIV, charging them with aggravated assault, attempted murder, and even bioterrorism. So here we are. Two weeks ago, The Guardian published an article on the weaponization and criminalization of COVID-19. Some states in the US are already considering enacting laws that would make it a crime to knowingly expose someone to COVID-19 or to threaten to do so. There's no argument there. If someone has COVID-19 and threatens to expose another person or deliberately infects them, absolutely, they should be punished. However, Several studies have found HIV criminalization laws targeted black and brown people. Brad Sears, who's an associate of, of public interest law at UCLA Law School, said that these laws were created to, in response to a negative stereotype of the predatory black, gay, or bisexual man. He also noted that as the pan pandemic is increasingly concentrated in among poor Americans and black and brown people, that could change the state's appetites for criminalization efforts. We run the risk of going back to the, the 90s when drug laws were enacted specifically to incarcerate black men and women for what are now today considered misdemeanors. We run the risk of filling our jails and maybe even prisons with black people whose actions and motivations are at best misunderstood and at worst deliberately misinterpreted so as to cause arrest and punishment. Actions like bird watching in the park. And if we fill jails and prisons, we create an environment that further sickens and kills a community vulnerable to COVID-19. So as states consider massive fines and long prison sentences, let us make sure that we don't repeat history. This is one of the rare instances where we can actually predict the future. Wherever you are, let your local, state, and federal elected officials know that as they consider laws related to COVID-19, particularly those that would criminalize it, we can avoid unfairly targeting, and in fact, we must avoid unfairly targeting the black community. And let's not create a situation where the park goer must fear that someone will accuse him of attempted murder through coughing. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>